Welcome to Baiju's classes. We are back again with yet another edition of International Review of International Events that has been specially curated for you, all those of you who are preparing for All India Competitive Examinations. And it surveys whatever has happened in different continents and different countries and how it impinges on India's national interest, how events are supposed to unfold, how they are going to influence each other and how India should respond to them. So we describe and we analyze and we hope you enjoy this like our past surveys for you. The resignation of the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Although there has been speculation about the health of uh, Shinzo Abe, he had been in and out of hospitals, but nobody had expected that the announcement of the resignation would be so sudden. The first thing which strikes the mind is that Shinzo Abe has been accused, his opponents have alleged him, of dynastic domination. His father was a foreign minister, his grandfather and grand uncles were prime ministers of Japan, and Shinzo Abe himself has had the longest serving in recent history a Japanese Prime Minister since 2012 to present day. He earlier was a Prime Minister in 2006 but again ill health had plagued him and he had to resign within a year. And then there had been a succession of uh, Prime Ministers coming and going through a revolving door till Shinzo Abe restored stability to Japanese economy and politics. Now he has been such a figure of stability and continuity that his departure seems to upset not only the Japanese politics but the international relations in the whole region. Indian Prime Minister Modi was looking for options elsewhere because India was not very comfortable despite its normalization of relations with China. They wanted to have a countervailing power and they were not comfortable going close either to United States of America or to Russia and Japan seems to fit the bill ideally. He had tried his best to develop good relationship with China but he he had been careful enough to have the Japanese option ready and Shinzo Abe had responded very very warmly to the Indian Prime Minister. So the Indians are also a little sad understandably that they have lost a trusted affectionate warm friend in Japan and India's friendship with Japan goes a long way because the Japanese remember very gratefully that it was an Indian judge who had given a dissenting judgment at the Tokyo trials and said that if the war crimes are to be affixed the liability for that both sides should be brought to the dock not only the defeated party should be tried for war crimes. So the Japanese have remembered this gratefully and there has been the history of collaboration during the freedom struggle between Netaji Subhash Bose and his Japanese patrons, uh, he also ended up on the losing side. But the Japanese remembered these things very, very warmly. That's one part of the thing. But let's get back to contemporary Japan. I think Shinzo Abe's greatest contribution is that he never lost the sense of balance. He was quintessentially a realist. He very much wanted to bring about constitutional amendments and rewrite the provisions which were forced upon Japan at the conclusion of the Second World War that it would not maintain an army. And ever since Japan has maintained though it is a sovereign independent nation, a self-defense force very well armed but not quite calling itself an army. Abe wanted to restore the sovereignty to his nation in totality. I thought that Japan had proved itself to be a responsible power, a reliable ally of the Western powers and it could be trusted having its armed forces again. That is one part. And he had set himself to re-establish Japan as a predominant economic power. Japan was in the cutting edge of technology in computers, optics, telecom, engineering, in shipping, etc. But in recent years, the more agile, smaller neighbors with lower cost of production, cheaper labor, also at times using copycat uh, patents and processes have established themselves as a competitor in the international market. The Japanese products are still supposed to be the best, but they are very expensive. So the Koreans, the Taiwanese and most of all the Chinese products have cut into the Japanese market. So Japan, which in the 1970s, 80s was on the verge of being declared an economic superpower, never could regain the old position after it suffered the shock of the oil energy crisis. But Shinjo Abe has been trying to convince his people that the Japanese farmers have to open up to competition from abroad. The Japanese industrialists should stop being protected and supported by the government all the time. They should open up to the changing world. So that was one part he was doing. He was bringing about reform slowly and because he was respected, he enjoyed popular support, he enjoyed the support of his party men, he could deliver. The recent years have been very tough for Japan because of 
China's expansion is driving South China Sea and China is using the North Koreans to terrify the Japanese and the South Koreans by allowing the North Koreans to indulge in reckless experimentation of nuclear weapons, rocketry and so on. And there is an ongoing dispute between Japan and China about the Senkaku Islands. So there have been these problems. And when the United States under President Trump came out with statements like the Americans would cut its costs of defending its allies elsewhere. Japanese also had to think in terms of relying on their own selves for their defense. So there has been this discussion that Japan would play a more dominant diplomatic, economic and strategic role in the southern China Sea part of the Indian Ocean. Maybe it would be a very crucial cornerstone of the quads where Japan, India, Australia and the US could form together uh, some kind of a bulwark, not a military alliance to contain China. All this is suddenly confronted with a big question mark at the moment. There is no problem that the Japanese are mature enough a people to decide on their succession. Uh, somebody who replaces him would be an experienced person, either an ex-foreign minister, ex-defense minister, ex-agriculture minister. But you know the problem with successors is that they will take time to strengthen their roots. Those who are popular with the voters are not necessarily enjoying the support of the MPs in the party. There are rivalries, there are contending ambitions, but I think one must again in praise and compliment Shinjo Abe for taking a decision in national interest and not letting political ambition go out in a blaze of glory. He wanted to host the Olympics in 2020, which coronavirus made it impossible. He was planning to get the constitution amended and he's been tactful about not offending Chinese by not visiting the shrine of war martyrs. But he sent his delegations and bouquets there. So it was a tricky balance he was maintaining. The Japanese relationship with Korea's the North or South has never been very easy. The Japanese relationship with China has been not very easy and Japan has been dependent on its energy security for the world outside. These problems remain and Shinzo Abe's successor will have to cope with them. We in India will have to worry about how we cope with the change Japan. Another development that kept international analysts busy last week was the US Secretary of State's Pompeo's visit to East European countries. This visit was supposed to be so important by Pompeo that he addressed the Republican Party's presidential convention virtually without in his absence. He would have very much liked to be present there in America, but he thought that this tour had certain substance, significance, strategic, which could not be delayed any further. This probably is in the context of what the Russians have been trying to do, give Putin giving support to Lukashenko in uh, Belarus and it needs immediate remedy. The activity and dynamism and aggression of Putin has to be matched within his domain, so to speak. The US has been accused of sowing seeds of dissension between European nations themselves. It has tried to divide the countries in East Europe and Central Europe away from Russia and tried to give convey signals to them that they would get support if they are tilting towards the United States. Part of the reason why Pompeo did not go to Germany because he was going to Poland and America has announced that they are shifting the NATO soldiers from German frontier to the Polish frontier, which is conveying a signal that Poland is now considered to be a more important strategic sensitive spot than Germany. So obviously this is not going to be liked by Germany. This also is not going to be liked by the Russians who think that the NATO forces are moving closer and closer to their border. The Czech Republic refused to come out openly and say that we will not buy uh, Huawei. But Slovenia came out in support of the American program. There is a populist regime there that they would uh, probably not have Huawei in their structure. Now, Poland, of course, is happy because the NATO forces are going next to it and it will come benefits with a closer relationship with America. So Pompeo goes back not entirely satisfied, but reasonably happy that he has at least created a stir and created a, some kind of a competition, some kind of a rivalry between these states, who gets closer to America and what the benefits are, what are the benefits, they will make, they have to make an assessment, how, how far do they go back to Russia, which is going to dominate them far more harshly, because America is a much more distant power, that's one part of the thing. The reaction to this was another interesting diplomatic tour mounted by the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi. He selected for his visit 
West European countries. He included France, Germany, Netherlands, Norway and Italy. Now Italy has had a special relationship with China. It was one of the early supporters of One Belt One Road but that's besides the point. At the moment Italy is very much a part of the EU and considered there it needs the succor and support of the larger members of EU to come out of the coronavirus crisis, come out, pull its economy out of the doldrums. The effort of the Chinese foreign minister was to convey to Europe that they should not become pawns in the American game. Americans have a vested interest in dominating Europe. They don't want to invest in their defense. They want their economies to suffer. So American economy flourishes, has no competition and Huawei is only the kind of a Trojan horse kind of a thing which they are maligning China with. There are no security risks involved and in any case the Germans and some others have made such a massive investment that to disengage from Chinese technology in communications would take years to come. So Huawei is only the symbol but the general idea was to say that look there should not be a boycott of Chinese products, software etc because that is what is going to hit China very hard. That's one part. The second part is that the Russian gas which comes through Nord 2 stream, the submarine channel to France and Europe is going to make Europe more dependent for its energy security on Russian uh, store of gas and oil. So there is a very complex kind of an international relationship in Europe. Certain West European countries, the larger countries like France and Germany are close to one another, are dependent on Russia to a certain extent, do not want to put all their eggs in the American basket. They don't even know what would happen after the elections. And all this was was taking place against the backdrop of the American presidential candidate of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party accepting the nomination. Normally these are very high profile media events but this year because of coronavirus they were on the sidelines and more attention was devoted to likely foreign policy initiatives, departures, breaks, continuities after Trump, with Trump or with Biden. So I think the Chinese are trying to prepare ground but the Chinese foreign minister also although they announced that the head of the Politburo dealing with foreign affairs will visit Italy, Portugal, Spain very soon and this visit was the first visit of a Chinese ranking foreign minister uh, after February after the Covid virus struck to any country outside but he again cannot claim that he went back uh, satisfied because he did not get a uh, clear cut assurance. Uh, he was told that the Europeans would take decisions on their own in their own interests, but no assurances were given either on Huawei or the boycott of uh, Chinese products. So one might say that these diplomatic itineraries of Pompeo and Wang Yi have met with mixed results. How they will impact on India is difficult to speculate at this moment. Ever since the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, there had been a small lull in America. But it seems that the lull was deceptive. The ugly head of racism is again being raised in America. Another black man was killed in extremely uh, shameful circumstances. A man called Blake was shot in Wisconsin in the back in front of his children when he was entering his car. And another brutish white suprematist policeman who was involved with this. This was not the end. This of course triggered immediately riots in the city. There was arson, there was looting and the bereaved family came out with a very graceful, courageous statement that their son who had died would not have approved of this. He was a law-abiding citizen. He loved the idea of America. He loved law and order. So they should not allow, the protesters should not allow hooligans and ruffians to come. They would only play in the hands of the opponents of equality and they will play in the hands of white supremates. Now this has been one of those planks which Trump has been trying to increase his support base for the election by saying that those who oppose him oppose the American constitution, are anarchists, are terrorists, are Antifa people, are ruffians, they are against law and order and if Biden wins that will be the end of American democracy, American economy, American family values and so on. But what followed the killing in Wisconsin was even more shameful. A teenager came out with a gun and shot some other black people. Now, unfortunately, this teenager has been arrested since. He proclaims himself to be a confirmed white supremacist and also says that he belongs to a movement called Blue Lives Matter. Now, blue, of course, is the color of police uniforms in America. And he seems to have become a vigilante to protect the rights of policemen who are under pressure 
to behave in a more legal manner, responsible manner and not be so blatantly racist. Right now, the man who has been very badly injured, Blake, struggling for his life in a hospital, his family is very agitated because they believe that he's been handcuffed in, even in this condition to his hospital bed. And the people suspect that a person who was responsible for killing of the black protesters would be out of bail. He would get all the advantages of being a teenager and he would have a sympathetic hearing, which non-white is supposed to be getting in America. What is clear? that we are going to witness one of the most violent run-ups to the presidential elections this year in America because both sides think that they stand to gain as long as this racial question comes to the forefront. Biden could always use this to say that Trump is supporting white supremacists, he is supporting the gun lobby and he is trying to defame anybody who is asking for a just egalitarian society. On the other hand, Trump would be of course getting arsenal when he says that, look, look, this is happening before your eyes. The protesters are not responsible. They are indulging in looting and arson. This is what I'm warning you against the Biden's presidency. So I'm afraid whether we like it or not, in coming days, we are going to witness more of more of this violence. What is clear is that America is divided almost down the middle between those who support white supremacists, the, who are with the gun lobby, aggressive Christian evangelists, and those who are asking for a just social system, a stake for the wretched of the earth in the economy, and just equal opportunities. In New Zealand, another incident of racial prejudice came to a closer last week, 27-28 year old Australian Brenton who had been accused, uh, he was sentenced finally last week of taking two machine guns with him and in two incidents of uh, violence, gun rapid gunfire, he had killed 51 people who were praying in the mosque in Christchurch and injured many more. Many families were ruined. So this was the moment of truth for the New Zealanders to face who have prided themselves in a country where there is very little gun violence, where there is very little racial prejudice. Uh, we are not going into the genocide of the indigenous people when the New Zealand was uh, populated by the white people, uh, the Maoris and the rest. Both Australia and New Zealand which take pride in their pluralistic culture, their tolerance, should not forget their pre-colonial past and imposing the white supremacy in their countries. But the point is that ever since then, the countries have been more receptive, more hospitable to people of different faith and different cultures. So this incident was shocking for New Zealand and people wanted to know what is going to happen. For past six decades, capital punishment has been abolished in New Zealand. So this man could not be sentenced to capital punishment. He has been given life imprisonment without any parole for 50 years, which means that for the rest of his life, he will spend in jail. This has brought some kind of a sense of relief to the victims who confronted the accused in the court, talked to him, they addressed him, they talked of their traumas and how they were trying to get bits and pieces of their life together again. This is perhaps a satisfactory closure of an incident of racial prejudice. But what is more important is that this is a case of a Christian vigilante, a white supremacist targeting Muslim minority praying in the mosque. Now, whenever there is a discussion of international terrorism, the Western media immediately directs us ever since 9-11 to a Islamic jihadi terror group who's perpetrating all these incidents of violence from Boko Haram to Al-Shabaab to ISIS to Al-Qaeda to the Mujahideen and Taliban in Afghanistan to whatever. So this is something which I think we have to keep in mind. Whenever there is a violence in Syria, Iraq, where there is a suicidal attack in Kabul or Afghanistan, they also suggest that it is only the spread of dogmatic, aggressive Islam which is resulting in these acts of terror. They tend to overlook that there is also Lord's Army in Africa, which is Christian armed groups, vigilantes. There are also tribal groups which indulge in terror. And of course, the incident in New Zealand shows very clearly that there are also some Christians who feel strongly about not sharing the space, territory or their economical benefits or judicial system with people who don't belong to the same religious system. Now, this is something which is common to what is happening in Wisconsin, happening in the North American continent, and we are witnessing it in Australia and New Zealand. Now, the Indians have to be very careful about this because Indians have a very large population of Muslims. And in recent past, there have been cases of people born in India, educated in India, being converted to an Islamic jihadi terror group and who have perpetrated uh, these acts of violence in Kabul. We have to remain on guard 
against the threats of Islamic terror, but we also have to be equally careful about protecting ourselves against the revival resurgence of white supremacists, the racist, who are descendants of the worst scum of the period of colonialism and imperialism, whether it is neo-Nazi violence in Europe, whether it is targeting of Muslims in New Zealand or elsewhere, we have to be very, very careful about this. The world is getting a little tired of Boris Johnson's antics in United Kingdom or Great Britain, choose what you like to call the country. Uh, he behaves in a manner as if he can always raise the stakes, take great risks and ultimately turn the deal in his favor or win the hand. Now the trouble is there are two or three things which happened last week in Britain which have been disappointing for people who think that this is a country which should have played, which can play a responsible role in diplomacy, in strategy and in the economic recovery of Europe and in the world. First of all, there was a scandal related to GCE A-level examinations. Uh, once again, the villain was Mr. Cummings, his favorite uh, advisor. And the algorithm which was supposed to grade students played havoc with it. They were undergraded and the whole higher education system seems to have come to a grinding halt because you do not know what grades to award students. Are they going to be raised upwards? Are they going to be standardized and so on? What First of all, the person who was made responsible or the scapegoat for this was the professionally qualified head of the educational body. The secretary in charge of the education who should have resigned did not resign. So at one level there was this total mismanagement typical of Boris Johnson's governing style. The other was yet again the prolonged agony about what would happen to Brexit, what would happen to Britain and European Union after the 31st of December this year. Now, Again, a trade negotiator from Britain ended up in Belgium. He came with hundreds of pages of new proposals, which were very disappointing for the European counterparts. They thought that they were a rehash of what had been discussed and agreed upon 10 times. The contentious issues, the fisheries, the passage of trucks, the movement of people up and down from the Irish backstop continues like that. There is no clarity about Ireland backstop. There is no clarity about you know, what would be the health hygienic standards applied. There is no clarity about what would happen to constituent units of United Kingdom like Wales and Scotland. But they don't agree that what Boris Johnson is doing is a good deal. Now, he thinks that if he blusters around his way, members of the European Union would blink first. But I think this game has been carried on too far, very foolishly, if one may say so. And neither the Germans nor the French are in a mood to make a compromise. What is worse, he keeps on bragging that he would be happier as a part of the Atlantic Alliance fraternity with America. And he says that Britain with its economy of uh, $3 trillion goes and joins the American economy, which after shrinking again is a large enough economy. So it would be the Anglophone economy would be larger in the Atlantic Brotherhood than the European economy. So you are throwing a provocative challenge. You are trying to daring the European Union to give you a deal which is on your terms. I don't think this has been happening because Britain has been perceived for long by members of the European Union as a freeloader who is not willing to pull its weight. But a lot of complicated issues remain, the legal system, the human rights system and so on. So everything will come to a sudden break on the 31st of December this year. And I don't think there will be another round or another opportunity given. The United Kingdom has passed the date long time back. So Britain under Boris Johnston would probably remain a very unpredictable place which nobody would like to deal with in a long-term perspective. There is one remote place on the map of the world that remains neglected most of the time. This is the Arctic. And in the Arctic, it is snowbound. It is a polar cap region covered by ice, very, very sparsely populated only in the fringes. It is yet a frontier which is yet to be fully explored, where people don't think that anything interesting in the context of international relations is happening. But what has been happening in recent past is a bit disturbing. It seems to be the next arena where the three major actors, the USA, the Russians and the Chinese, are going to jockey for a position of advantage. And this jockeying for position of advantage at the moment 
is working out in favor of Putin's Russia because when the rest of the world was keeping focus elsewhere in Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in South China Sea, in Pacific Rim, maybe in the Latin American continent, Putin was silently moving his nuclear powered submarines, his icebreakers in this region and has started working towards route which connects Russia's Arctic region with Canada and the North America. It would revolutionize the transportation of gas, other commodities, and it would open for Russia a market and an area of strategic influence which is unforeseen. How others react to it is very different. Americans do not have at the moment the presence and the expertise in ice breaking because they are not an Arctic country. Now, Donald Trump has tried to buy Greenland from Denmark in exchange for Puerto Rico because he wanted to reach as close to the Arctic zone as he could possible. Interestingly, Chinese are active, although they are not an Arctic uh, nation, but they claim that they are a nation proximate neighborly to Arctic, although the nearest point is almost 900 to 1000 kilometers away from Chinese territory. But the Chinese leave no opportunity to stake a claim, fly a flag, and at the moment the Russians and the Chinese might find it convenient to keep the USA or the Canadians out of this zone. Now, this has implications not only for strategy. Putin is very fond of saying the polar route, you know, one belt, one route China is doing. There is a polar route which will connect the new Silk Road with this. So Chinese one belt road somewhere will fit in with the polar road. Uh, that is in distant future. But the impact of all this activity, ice breaking on the climate on a very fragile ecological system is nobody is bothered about it at the moment and what its implication will be for the rest of the world. Big icebergs have broken out almost of the size of a small country. The temperature is rising here. The impact it will have on the wildlife, the polar bears, the seals, the salmon under ice, we don't know what will happen to it. So we are waiting with almost bated breath another conflict, not necessarily explosive and military, but skirmishing which is taking place in an area and who knows this might soon follow in Antarctic as well. Tensions continue to mount in the South China Sea unabated in the past week. The Chinese felt threatened by the naval exercises undertaken by US warships in this zone which they dispute. Americans kept insisting that they were only active in the high seas. China had no business to intercept them or interfere with them. But the Chinese say that this is not high seas, this is the territory which it claims as its exclusive economic zone and it thinks that nobody has a business to undertake provocative actions there. The American fighter pilots flew very close to Chinese airspace and the Chinese did not like it. The Americans have massive aircraft carriers which the Chinese cannot at the moment match. They are under production for China. But what the Chinese did, Chinese demonstrated their military might by firing aircraft carrier killer missile uh, as a warning in the high seas to let the Americans know that if need be, they could even sink an aircraft carrier with its planes from a distant missile which could strike at them. So people have started worrying that a small incident might flare up into very destructive war in this region and will China have the nerves to do it? But the tensions have been mounting almost everywhere. The Taiwanese also undertook military drills suggesting to its people that the Chinese might like after Hong Kong to reclaim Taiwan which they have always said is a one China, no two Chinas. Most of the countries in the world have refused to recognize Taiwan. They only recognize this trade delegation. They are given some diplomatic uh, privileges but no equality as an embassy or a representation. Recently the Chinese took the trouble of uh, uh, getting a small microscopic uh, country like Kiribati in the South Pacific to disengage itself from Taiwan and recognize People's Republic of China. It became a little controversial because the Chinese ambassador who when he reached Kiribati walked over the backs of the native aboriginal people uh, and they said look this is how China treats the racially looks down at other people but the Kiribati people themselves said this is part of our tribal culture we welcome a guest we welcome a newcomer to our house like this and nobody else should teach us especially the white supremacists in Australia and New Zealand who are guilty of genocide in most of these small islands to teach us how we should behave but the important point to note here is 
that the Chinese is not leaving even a small country like Kiribati in its gang up against Taiwan. So Taiwan gets more and more isolated and Taiwan at the moment is technologically competent but the Chinese know that at the moment the government in power in Taiwan is one which asserts independence but there are enough number of people in Taiwan who wants a reunion with the motherland and they often indulge into fisticuffs outside. That is one part about Taiwan. The part is the South Korean, North Korean relationship has taken a turn for the worse. They fly balloons and the balloons have propaganda material which is supposed to uh, spread disaffection in North Korea and the North Koreans have said that they will not maintain a truce or peace with South Korea. So the tensions have been rising in the Korean Peninsula, in, in and around Taiwan, in the Sea of Japan and firing of the Chinese cruise missile is a disturbing uh, development. What is ironical is that in the same week China got elected to a permanent membership for the next 10 years on the laws of seas tribunal, arbitration tribunal. Now this is Ironical because China doesn't always recognize the United Nations uh, Convention on Laws of Seas. When it suits it, it invokes it. When it doesn't suit it, it says we were not a party to development of the international law. We don't, we don't accept this. We don't accept its propositions. But right now we have a Chinese member in the arbitration tribunal which will judge disputes about territorial disputes in Indian Ocean and elsewhere for a 10 year period. So this also indicates the clout which China seems to enjoy because the votes in favor of China were massive. More than 160 people voted for him out of 193 membership of the United Nations. So you can imagine that the China is not isolated despite all its demonization and vilification. This creates problems for India because if the world is treating the South China Sea and the confrontation between America and China as a flashpoint, they will give less importance to the clash between China and India on the land border in the Himalayan area. The world has remained distracted in past few months with the problem of how to deal with coronavirus pandemic. If there is a little time left, there are other flashpoints from Libya to Eastern Mediterranean to the South China Sea which seem to assume a greater importance. And the world has almost forgotten about another crisis which might be upon us sooner than we thought it would be and that is problems created by climate change. Some would even suggest that the vectors which spread the coronavirus also can be related to some climate change issues but that without stretching the argument this far we would say that what the world has been confronted with was Hurricane Laura which hit recently the Texas-Louisiana coast at the, with the speed of 150 miles per hour. It was a category 4 most devastating hurricane and the meteorologists in America told the residents in these two states that it is between you and God now. Uh, just take refuge in a shelter as fast as you can. And it was easier said than done because the restrictions operating due to coronavirus, you cannot crowd people into areas. So which crisis do you cope with first? Fortunately, the cyclone lost some of its speed, some of its force as it moved inwards, but there were surges, flooding areas and life will take a long time to get back to normal. This was yet another reminder that the world is neglecting the climate change issue or the crisis only at its peril. And the second example of this is, uh, we have referred to this in the past also, that the corona crisis, the economic problems have distracted people in Brazil from coping with raging fires in Amazon rainforest and of course Bolsonaro brazenly says that he has not caused them, he can control them, fires ignite on in high temperature, they are self-combusting but there is a different story. Probably those who want to encroach in the forest lands, the reserved living spaces for the indigenous people set fires which are not controlled and then the forest is cleared for alternative uses. It is only the pressure of multinational corporations who were funding these infrastructural products in this area which have forced Bolsonaro to at least acknowledge that the problem exists. But it is not only Brazil, it is also California. The fires have reached in Los Angeles, billion dollar houses are being destroyed, people are coming to terms with their memories going in flames in a blink and 
to live like refugees in their own country. The loss of property is very massive. There are raging brush fires, forest fires in Australia. So Australia, California, Brazil, they all tell you the same story, the, which Hurricane Laura was trying to tell, uh, which is what is desertification, droughts, which is rising of temperature in the Arctic area. These are issues we thought were much less important than coping with the virus, which were much less important than military conflicts, flashpoints emerging in different places. But we should never forget if the crisis coincide, it will be impossible to deal with any one crisis properly. And scientists are worried that there may be a second surge of a coronavirus. So we cannot keep postponing dealing with climate change issues for an eternity. There is one country in the international arena which remains enigmatic. Its sphinx-like leader Kim Jong-un never lets on what is happening in his country. There was President Donald Trump who thought that he could meet him as an equal, tempt him, persuade him to join the International Committee of Nations and strike a deal with him. He met him twice but it did not succeed. He hasn't given up hope as yet, but he's busy with his election campaign this year. So that gives a certain space uh, for the North Korean leader to do what he does best. That is to keep confusing the world about his intentions. He did two things last week, which are very surprising. He called a meeting of the political committee of the Communist Party of North Korea and admitted that things were not going on as they had been planned. The country was having some problems in economy. Its development was retarded. He did not, of course, say that conditions were very dire, but he said that there would have to be a course correction and change. This coming from a leader who never publicly either owns up a mistake, is almost enjoys a godlike status. Nobody dares criticize him to even admit that there were problems in his country, which he always thought was a paradise communist paradise of sorts is a very, very surprising development. What happened right after that was again more mysterious. Once again, rumors started circulating that Kim Jong-un was dead. What we were watching was a lookalike. Just before that, he was very sick. The week before that also, there had been these kinds of rumors. People had tried to track the movement of his car or his yacht or his special train through satellite imagery. It had been announced that he had transferred most of his power to his sister, who's supposed to be even more ruthless than him and supposed to be more efficient. And she presents a picture of a younger leader who's probably not fat and obese and a debauch playboy, etc. But all this is a demonization of the North Korean leader who's not an illiterate. He's been educated in Switzerland, who has a fondness for good things of life. But then which leader in the world would not say so? Donald Trump would go golfing. Somebody else would go take a yacht. Uh, his associates do that. So Kim Jong-un's rumors of his demise have been found to be exaggerated rumors even in past. So what will happen at this time? But this time what appears is that there is a change in the North Korean power structure. Maybe it will remain within the family. Maybe the sister will have a more substantial role to play. The mere admitting whether it was lookalike or Kim Jong-un himself that there are problems is a major deviation from what North Korea's behavior pattern has been. But the interesting thing is that North Korea remains in possession of nuclear weapons, of uh, long distance uh, projectiles which can hit. It remains a rogue state which can only be controlled perhaps to a certain extent by its patrons, the Chinese, but who probably would not like to destroy his power potential or his threat perception because that's the best way to keep Japan, South Korea and Taiwan under control. Uh, India has a good relationship with South Korea but doesn't have a close relationship with North Korea. But we are interested and involved and engaged with developments in Northeast Asia. So we must keep a close look at what is happening in North Korea. This brings us to the close of our weekly survey of international relations. We have covered a lot of ground this, this time. We have covered from Arctic to South China Sea to Brexit to the uh, diplomatic uh, tours of the American Secretary of State and the Chinese Foreign Minister. And we yet to have seen about what might be the shape of things to come in the big power competition in the Arctic region. We have taken into account the impact of the climate change and the kind of crisis which can emerge out of climate change, not in distant future, 
but in immediately and interfere with our fighting the world coping with the coronavirus. All this is going to retard the speed of the economic recovery of various nations. We have you may feel left out some continents like Africa, but not really because there the flashpoints remain the same, there the issues remain the same and very soon we shall be revisiting them. We have referred to in passing to the flashpoints in Libya, in the eastern Mediterranean, the possibilities of a clash between Turkey and France and Egypt, but there are positive signs also of uh, signaling on the part of Sudan and Ethiopia that they might negotiate their dispute on the Nile Dam with Egypt. So let's hope for the best, let's revisit Africa hopefully in happier circumstances next week. Let's also hope that the tensions reduce elsewhere so the world can constructively think in terms of cooperating, how best to cope with coronavirus, how best to make vaccine available to majority of its population and how to accelerate the task of economic recovery. Till we meet again next week, thank you for watching and goodbye.